Good morning or good afternoon. It's uh, my pleasure today to speak to you about uh, prevention and significance of diarrhea in dairy calves. So our presentation will be an introduction of Solvet. We'll talk about the impact of diarrhea and about the etiology in this short presentation. The Solvet family is uh, living in Calgary, an area, and we'll see here the founder of uh, the Solvet company, Dr. Merle Olson and his wife, Barb Olson. Solvet has a different approach than many other companies. Solvet is really vested into the community and is in close contact with veterinarians, producers like yourself and the industry in general. We take their input and their ideas, communicate with them, take it into the research facility, and we'll come out with programs that will market to veterinarians, producers, and industry. It's interesting when we talk about financial impact that when you talk to key opinion leaders in North America, they admit that there is really not a lot of um, access to publications that show the financial impact. So we need to kind of look at it holistically and say, what are the costs associated with diarrhea and dairy calves? First of all, the debt loss. We have the pharmaceutical cost. We have labor and veterinary cost. And to be a little bit more specific, we get a decrease in survival rate and in a decrease in survival rate from calving to 350 days in milk. Fortunately, some researchers have dug into this a little bit more and we'll see some more information here. There is a decrease in survival rate 730 days after calving. Reduced milk production efficiency is cited in some papers and when you look at calves uh, treated for scours and follow them in the herd, you'll find that they are two times, 2.5 times more likely to be cold. Calves treated for scours are 2.9 times more likely to calf after 30 months. And we all know how much that costs. This particular paper cites $100 per month after 24 months. Why do I show this, Ray, this slide? I show this slide for two reasons. We have pre-weaning and post-weaning here, pre-weaning to your left, post-weaning to your right. And what you see when you look at the um, colors, there are still an awful lot of calves treated with antibiotic. The antibiotic is listed here, the dark blue areas. So diarrhea, pneumonia and navel infection. Those are the common three diseases in pre-weaning and post-weaning diarrhea is not as much of an issue, but pneumonia is becoming a much bigger issue. So what kind of pathogens are we thinking about when we see a calf with diarrhea? My first comment to you is don't take this to the bank. Don't take this chart into the barn and look at it and say, you are five weeks old, so you either have coccidia, salmonella, or crypto. But it gives you an idea that there are a lot of organisms involved when we talk about diarrhea. This slide really speaks to diagnostics are important on the farm. This is uh, something we have done in Solvet. We do a lot of uh, field studies, and this is a slide of a field study that we're doing looking at the effects of antibiotics um, or the, the benefits of using antibiotics, rather, in calf diarrhea. You'll see a Rhoda, Corona, E. coli, and Cryptosporidium listed. 
And the positive uh, diagnoses are marked in red. So in this particular group of cattle we're looked at, we see rotavirus is the predominant cause of diarrhea and together with cryptosporidium. On the right hand side, you see the anterior check and that is the test kit we used in this specific operation. It's always a question, uh, is my farm any different than any other farm? And this gives you an idea about Kansas State. Kansas State has a veterinary diagnostic laboratory and they find a lot of rota, they find corona, they find a lot of crypto. And when we're talking about antibiotics and treatments for diseases caused by bugs that are sensitive to antibiotics, you see E. coli is only 1.2% of the cases and salmonella is another 1.2% of the caseload. So why are these calves dying? Pre-weaning, they're dying from either diarrhea or they die from pneumonia listed here. And then we have the navel problems, the calving problems, and these are the miscellaneous others like being stepped on or um, <clears throat> other things that happen in the first few weeks of a calf's life. So prevention is something that um, <clears throat> is near and dear to Solvet's heart and should be near and dear to your heart as well. Prevention is something that we have a lot of things to uh, influence with. We can talk colostrum, we can talk hygiene and environment, and we can talk about vaccination programs. You're probably thinking another boring presentation about colostrum. I hope that you'll have an open mind and listen to it because remember, when you go to a meeting or listen to a presentation and 100% of all you hear is new, then you're probably in the wrong room. You always have to look at little things that can make a big difference on your operation. I'd like to talk to you today about quantity, quality, cleanliness, quickness, and monitoring passive transfer. This slide is a little complicated at first uh, look. So let's look what we uh, are trying to say here. The first thing, um, you have to provide 200 grams of IgG, so the immunoglobulins that are in the colostrum. And you feed that uh, colostrum 8.5 to 10% of body weight. So a calf that uh, weighs 85 pounds would get eight and a half pound of good colostrum at first feeding. And we'll be talking about what good colostrum is in a few slides down, uh, down from here. So the success of IgG transfer is defined of at least 10 gram of IgG in the serum. So in other words, we put the IgG first in the calf, then the calf absorbs the IgG, and then we'll measure it later on in the serum. So when we are trying to do that in this specific study published in the Journal of Dairy Science, you see that 87% of the producers was able to get four liters in, 71% three liters and 29% of the people got in two liters. Now we're moving to the right on the x-axis we have the survival probability so the chance that the calf is going to make it and here is the days of age. Now we said we wanted to be at 10 gram at least of serum IgG and you'll see that even if you're barely above 10, your survival rate is still slightly above 90%, I would consider that not really being acceptable. So the take home message is, even if you have really good colostrum, 
and you only do one four liter feeding, you still are in an area that can uh, benefit from some improvement. So these are the three ways to uh, measure colostrum quality. Um, it's uh, the bricks is here, and you'll see the, the normal values here for poor, fair, good, and very good colostrum. This is the IgG, the grams per liter in the colostrum. And that can be measured with the bricks, or it can be measured here where you get a readout, or it can be measured here as well. Quickness. So quickness is really something, how fast are you able to get the colostrum in? And um, <clears throat> it pays to really be on top of your game. We have here shown on the x-axis the IgG concentration in the blood again, and here the time after birth. And it shows clearly that the sooner you are, this is the zero hour line, the higher the amount of IgG in the serum is, and the slower you are, the lower the amount of IgG is. So the take home message is don't delay giving colostrum. This slide, probably very confusing at first, so let me walk you through it. <clears throat> there is a few things, there are a few things rather that I would like to um, discuss with you. We the first fact is that bacteria hinder the absorption of colostrum. So in other words, if you have contaminated colostrum, the goodies in the colostrum are not able to get into the blood. So total bacteria counts should be less than uh, 50,000 CFU per milliliter, and coliforms should be less than 5,000 CFU per milliliter. So when we look here, the red columns are the blood protein. Blood protein is a reflection on the amount of immunoglobins, the amount of protection the calf absorbed. And we'll see here that when the amount of cells in the colostrum is increasing the amount of total protein, so the amount of protection in the calf is diminishing. This line shows the clinical score. How the higher the clinical disease score, the worse the calf is off. So again, when we have fewer lower amount of total protein in the, in the blood, the calf is more likely to get sick. This study was done in five herds and was uh, based looking at bacteriological contamination versus total protein. So where do we get the bacteria load? It's quite simple, uh, think about it, you know, Wash the other, clean the other. That's the first step. What is your collection bucket looking like? Is it kind of grungy looking or is it nice and clean? Where do you store your colostrum? We know that uh, warm, a warm area can be an ideal a breeding ground for bacteria. And last but not least is the feeding equipment. When was the last time you really did a good cleaning job on your feeding equipment. This is a little bit of a complicated uh, slide as well because we are using two different um, values here on the x-axis. So on uh, the red line is serum protein, so again, a reflection of amount of protection in the blood. The blue line is the amount of IgG 
in the calf's blood. So the take home message here is that the cut pound for the total protein is 5.8 gram per deciliter. So you like to be above 5.8 gram per deciliter when you're evaluating uh, your success of your colostrum program. Actually, this is done on a lot of calf ranches in the U.S. routinely, where a lot of loads of calves are coming in. The calves are being bled and checked for their uh, total protein. And when the total protein falls below a certain mark, uh, it may be 5.8, um, the uh, person selling the calves gets a warning. The cut point for the bricks is 8.9%. So our aim is check the total protein in the blood of those calves. And I would say any time uh, is a good time, but don't let it run much past the first few days. When I saw this slide for the first time, I thought this is a very complicated slide and why are we doing this and why would we even show this? There are two things that I would like uh, to talk about looking at this slide. The first thing is um, there is really not a difference and that was um, done by work done by Michael Steele who is now at the University of Guelph there is really little difference in giving a calf colostrum by means of a nipple bottle or by means of a bag of oral feeding tube. The key is here <clears throat> to monitor what are the calves doing at first feeding and second feeding and when you should interfere. The first thing here is when the calf takes less than two liters at their first feeding, you immediately have to tube the calf to make up the total of three liters. If she ingests two to three liters, I think knowing what is currently the recommendation, I would still top it up a little bit, but uh, that calf obviously is off to a better start than the calves that are going less than two liters of colostrum. The second feeding is again a feeding of colostrum, and this is important because there is more to colostrum than only the aminoglobulins. So again, if the calf does uh, drink more than a liter, uh, 12 hours of age, <clears throat> we're probably okay. If she uh, ingests less than a liter, she needs to be tube fed two liters. So the same applies here. Calves that are on a good path of drinking a lot, they need to be too fat when they don't do that at their second feeding and similarly to the third feeding 12 hours later. Just recently in um, 2020, there is a new paper that was uh, published and it is published with the brain power of a lot of people. And it is something that should be very much attainable for you on your farm. The goal is to measure passive immunity on farm. And <clears throat> we can do that in various ways. We can look at total protein. We can look at the bricks or we can uh, do the serum IgG. The total protein measurements or the BRICS measurements, they are the most commonly done. So the goal here is to have excellent transfer of passive immunity. And your goal should be that more than 40% of your calves are falling in this category. And let me, let, let me uh, tell you, that is a doable goal. Good should be around 30%, fair about 20%, and poor, and here is the number 10 again, what I showed in a slide a few moments ago. Poor is considered a serum IgG of less than 10. And this truly should be in your herd less than 10% of your calves. 
Hygiene and environment is another very important part of calf management. I'd like to introduce you to a few things. We have the nesting score here, and um, we see various amount of bedding. And this is really what we would like to see in a newborn calf. The temperature is important. Uh, most of uh, the barns are built for uh, the comfort of the animals and uh, the good barns, that is. And here is the thermal neutral zone where the newborn calves feel themselves comfortable. You see quite a few of the farms that were checked in the Quebec area were not really in the thermal neutral zone. One way to help with that is to use the calf jacket. What I've seen working very well on some of the dairies where they have a little bit more of an issue with temperature regulation in the barn. The litter humidity is another test that we should never forget to do because a wet, a wet environment is not conducive to raising healthy calves. So sit on your knees in the bedding and what is it like? Is it dry, wet, or damp? Ventilation is another area that is often overlooked <clears throat> and uh, we're not going into a dissertation on ventilation today but you should try to get at least four air changes per hour, even in the winter. On the right-hand side, bottom right-hand side, you see a beautifully designed barn, but uh, there is no worry. A person can really try to um, do their best <clears throat> with the ventilation in their barn by just adhering to these basic guidelines of four air changes in the winter, 10 to 20 in the spring and fall, and 40 air changes in the summertime. This slide is about vaccinations. And vaccination, there is a place for vaccination. But what about the antibodies you generate in the cow? The first thing to know about those antibodies, they do not cross the placenta. So we're back to giving the calf colostrum. The colostrum is critical, but the quality of the colostrum can be improved by making specific antibodies for your farm in the cow's body. So the fractionation of the dam uh, obviously need to happen before colostrum production and the primer vaccination has to happen after mid-pregnancy and the booster three to six weeks before calving. Some farms are enrolled in annual vaccinations that include E. coli, rotavirus, coronavirus and clostridium. The interesting thing to think about is why is the E. coli vaccination so effective? Because it truly is. And the reason is because the E. coli disease the, uh, typically happens in the first few days of life. And at that time, the antibody levels in the milk are still the highest. Vaccination of the calf is also a possibility. It needs to be done as soon as possible after birth and we can go with an oral administration and vaccinate against E. coli, rotavirus, and coronavirus. The good news for you as a producer is that pharmaceutical companies are still looking at new and improved vaccination methods, and um, I would say a vaccination schedule is definitely something that uh, should be on your farm and should be discussed with your veterinarian. So what are the take-home messages for today? The take-home messages are that rotavirus and cryptosporidians are major causes for diarrhea in young calves. 
we need to look at proper management of colostrum. It is not just I give my calf four liters of colostrum, so I am doing a good job. It is giving clean colostrum and timely colostrum and giving a second feeding of colostrum 12 hours later. It's a good idea to monitor passive transfer. We went through a few of the tools that you can use on farm. It's really not that hard. Uh, it's just a matter of getting it done and getting it started. The focus on hygiene and a good environment is there. I know uh, we can always show you a great calf barn, but I'd like to, to leave it with you that uh, some small modifications may make an average calf barn into a very nice calf barn. Vaccination does not replace the need for a good colostrum management program. As we showed you, the vaccination immunizes the cow, uh, gets more antibodies in the milk, in the colostrum, but colostrum management is still key. Thank you very much for your time.